Well, a very pleasant Saturday morning. Hello, how are you? Welcome to the show. The guys are back in studio. We are broadcasting, as always, from the iHeart Media Studios in uh, lovely, sunny Southern California, San Diego to be exact. We trust you had a good week. The uh, weekend is here. We've got a, uh, is it a great show, uh, John? Would you call it a great show lined up today? You know, between great and very good, they're still debating. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say semi-mediocre, but, but well, then I thought of the guests that we have, and it can't just be mediocre. Well, that's true. I was going to say, just like the election, votes are still coming in. Yeah, they're still coming in. <laughs> but, you know, I, once they find out that Deborah Lee Baldwin is the one right. that's been nominated. So she'll be our guest today, as yeah. John mentioned. It's been a and, while since we've talked to her. Right, friend of the show. It's right. been it's been a few years, actually. We had her in studio a few years ago. Right, the queen of succulents. Right, right. <laughs> okay. A little dangerous there, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> Tiger, Tiger is with us, obviously. So did you see that, um, you know, you mentioned beautiful, sunny San Diego, that uh, we were on the uh, national platform last night. Do you know why? Uh, is it because of the article? No, well that that too. Yeah, the but, CNN um, article on the Rose the, uh, show. The basketball game that was on top of the uh, USS Abraham Lincoln. Oh yeah, Gonzaga that... versus Michigan State. Yeah, Gonzaga, Michigan State. It's you're right. Kind of cool that they do a basketball game on top you, of you an know aircraft what, though? carrier. They they did that several years ago with the Aztecs, and it was such a windy day. Yeah, it was. They not... throw the ball up, and the wind would blow the ball this way or that way, and it was it was. It, I'm yeah. not sure how well it uh, it turned but, out. What about yesterday's game though? It was great, and it came down to the final shot. Gonzaga won by, I think, one. But, um, it, it, you know, you mentioned, you know, wind. I don't know if there's a lot of places that they can do that in San Diego, uh, besides San Diego. You right, know, right. A, num- number one, there's not a lot of places that can have an aircraft carrier. Um, <laughs> well, we're one of those places. <laughs> you know, We can have and, an aircraft carrier. And then number two, this time of year, I mean, the East Coast, it's going to be rain and wind and hurricanes. Right, and, right. You know, up in Northern California, it's going to be damp and wet. You can be sliding all over the court. So, so there's the there's the uh, the basketball game that was on. Which ship was it on? The USS Abraham Lincoln. The Abraham Lincoln. So yeah. my alma mater lost. Oh, really? Yeah. In Michigan State. That's <laughs> Michigan right. State. Oh. I I don't follow college sports closely anymore, though. Is Magic Johnson still on the team? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Him and Larry Bird also. Actually, it yeah. wasn't Magic Johnson. It was back then. Was Irvin Johnson? <laughs> right, and it was Michigan State, right? Yeah. And uh, then uh, Larry Bird went to Indiana. No, he Celtics. Because he came out the same. Well, I'm, I'm thinking college. Because he came out the same time Magic did. Uh-huh. Same class, same year. Back in the '80s, right? Late '80s. Whatever. Yeah. Uh-huh. So there's but our then, college basketball talk for the day. But then, yeah, you mentioned the CNN article about the Rose Auction. About the Rose Auction, cool. which is in our newsletter. Yeah. The link, which is in our newsletter, if you want to read all about that, that was very nicely done. Did yeah. you set that up, John? I did. You did, see? Contacts over there at the big networks. So let's give John a uh, proverbial pat on the back. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, welcome to the show. We've got a lot of people tuned in this morning. And, uh, yes, likes Rick your says, shirt. Rick says Indiana State. Rick, thank you. Yes, Indiana State for learning. Can we get see? We could talk about anything. Yeah. And and people are going to have knowledge. Gardeners have a lot of knowledge about a lot of things. Yeah. So thank you for that, Rick. Yes, and because he also went on to coach the Indiana Pacers later on as well, Larry Bird. I have a theory about what Tiger just said. I think people listen to us because they don't know as much about gardening as they do other things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. So that's so why to find that's more. why whenever we have a question, they know what's they can answer. They yeah. know what's going on. Tanya checks in from San Jose. Hey, Good sorry morning. about your San Jose Sharks, Tanya. Off Ooh. to kind of a rough year so far. <laughs> that's that's Brian Sport hockey there. Absolutely. Yeah. NHL. <laughs> How about uh Ginny from uh uh India? Oh. Good morning. Or wow, good morning. Or Absolutely. Or what ta- is there now, now what time is it? I'm, I'm going to guess uh, what, 7 o'clock at night, 8 o'clock at night? Almost I don't know because he said opposite. good morning, so it could oh. be morning over there. But you know what? It would be tomorrow morning, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the Deborah's show's on. over. Yeah. Was it a good show, Ginny? <laughs> Deborah's on right now. Can't wait to uh, chat and answer questions. Yeah. Oh, so uh, great. Awesome. Deborah in the green room right now. If she monitors <laughs> our show on Facebook. Yeah, we should have a virtual green room. So welcome to all those on uh, Biz Talk Radio listening to the pre-recorded show from last week. As uh, we always do, reminding you that if you are listening on Biz Talk Radio, want to see us, watch us live, go to our Facebook page, 8 o'clock on the West Coast, Eastern Time Zone, 11 o'clock, John. And yeah. we've got Central and Mountain everywhere in between. You can figure that out. 
You know, for our listeners, we have listeners. In, uh, I got a message from a listener in Canada, Ontario, Canada. Ontario, right. And uh, we have uh, Pakistan, India. Right. Send us pictures of your gardens to John at GardenAmerica.com. Yeah, we'd love to Just see Just email that. me, and we'll we'll put them in the newsletter. Sure, sure. I'd love to have them from somewhere besides California. Oh, and, if you, and if you want to get the newsletter, go to our website, which is GardenAmerica.com. Just I'm, sign up. Just sign up right there on the homepage, and you get right. the newsletter every Friday, obviously in your email. Still $50 to sign up? No, it's free. What? We don't what? charge. No, it's free. Stop <sighs> it. No Stop. wonder the bank account is so low. Yeah, exactly. So it's free. We don't share the information, but it is free. The newsletter gives you articles. It gives you pictures. We talk about upcoming guests. It's uh, something that once you get it, you can't live without it. You got to have. You know what? I'm really interested. I mean, obviously, when you get pictures of gardens from all around the world, it's interesting to see what they have <clears throat> and what we don't have. Right. But I'd also be interested to see what they have that is almost everybody has. You know, can you imagine if they send us a picture from Pakistan and it's Scavola New Wonder, <laughs> you know, like, right. like just a blue fan flower, you know, hanging basket. And you're like, wow, these plants do make their way all around the world. It's pretty so by the same token, too, if it's something rare that we don't have or see, that would be just as interesting. Just, yeah. wow, we don't. What is that? Can well, we grow that here? Large mm. parts of India are tropical climates, yeah. right? So mm. there's a lot of things that grow there that maybe we, we would grow as a house plant mm -hmm. that are landscape right. plants there. Yeah. You know, like I remember the first time I went to Hawaii and saw pothos. How big <laughs> the leaves were? And yeah. they were like going, Huge. growing up palm trees with gigantic, and they were split, right? Yeah. Like a right. It would look like a split philodendron. Yeah. We right. were on a hike when I was over there, and I actually asked the tour guide, what is that? He goes, it's pothos. I'm like, wow. Really? Because I can, I can, I can climb behind that, and you can't see me. Yeah. Just the one leaf; it's so big. Yeah. Is that the humidity? Is that just the conditions there? That it's not the heat; it's the humidity. It's the humidity, yeah. <laughs> but the conditions obviously are are different for growing plants that big. And you know, and then in terms of, um, you know, we had uh, George on last week, and he was talking about volcanic rock dust and volcanic right. soil, and how fertile it can be in with with life and. You know, that's Hawaii. It's all right. fresh, new. You know, there's a lot of minerals. There's a lot of nutrients in that soil. Even though it's rock solid, <laughs> you can't dig in it. When the plants do get whatever they need out of it, there's a good amount of nutrients in it. So, yeah. That camera loves John. You, you look good on camera, John. <laughs> camera loves you. It's been on you for, for a while now, and it just it can't. You know, we want to switch cameras, but the camera says, no, i got to focus on John. <laughs> I picked uh, this week's quote of the week from... Luther Burbank, and I did it because Deborah Lee Baldwin is going to be our guest and uh, talking about cactus and succulents and her new calendars and things. But I thought this, I thought this was interesting. I, I wonder how old Luther was when he came up with this quote, or if he, <laughs> if it was tongue in cheek. But he said the secret of impro improved plant breeding, apart from scientific knowledge, is love. While I was conducting experiments to make spineless cacti, I often talked to the plants. You have nothing to fear, I would tell them. You don't need your defensive thorns. I will protect you. <laughs> Gradually, the useful plant of the desert emerged in a thornless variety. <laughs> That's great. That's a great quote. Outstanding. Oh. You know, speaking of our listeners knowing a lot about everything, I teased Tanya about her San Jose Sharks. Uh -huh. And so Carla jumps in. I think it will always be the Ducks. They're worse. Oh, good one. And they're on both accounts, they're correct. Yeah. So, good for yeah. you. We are I told you the only hockey game I ever went to in my life was uh, the Ducks <laughs> up in Anaheim. Really? Yeah. All those years that you lived in Detroit. Never once. And all those Both years. Both my brothers have season tickets to the Red Wings. But when you lived in Detroit, you're, we're talking about legends that played. Gordy Ted Howe. Lindsay, Gordy Howe. Ted Lindsay. You and know, Terry Sawchuck. Oh, let's see. Who was, like, oh, who was the know. other one? Uh, I, I told you my aunt did his book work. Uh, Alex Del Vecchio. You know, oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, you know, on Luther Burbank's quote from the newsletter, on how he was convincing succulents they didn't need spines. That's what Brian does to convince his plants that they don't need soil. 
<laughs> you he's know, like, he's he just like this, depletes them of this all is how, soil. See, this is how urban legends begin. One depletes time, them of all soil, you and could, then he you just could grow. Them. You don't need you any don't soil. Need any one soil. time, you don't John need your comes roots over. Covered. John comes over one time years ago, and I was out of soil. Basically, I filled one up as much as I could, and he mm. comes over and says, "Well, this one doesn't have any soil on it." In it, and I go, "Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to re- remedy that." And it's grown into this thing now that my plants, none of my plants have soil. <laughs> No, most of them do. I have to admit, I've been repotting some of the roses, and uh, and a few of them. I thought to myself, subconsciously, maybe I'm glad Brian's not here. <laughs> or maybe I'll try Brian's way; it'll save me money. No, no, there was there were, I had maybe a dozen that had almost no soil left. And in see, the they're pots. they're fine, aren't they? And you know why there was no soil? We got to take a break. So tell me quick. Sow bugs. Ah, so, ah, there you go. That's my excuse. There you yeah. go. Thank you. <laughs> hey, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah, we're going to come back with John's quote of the week. And then, of oh, course, yeah. uh, our guest. <laughs> In case you didn't listen to it the first we're time. We're going to read it again for you. <laughs> John's going to read it again because it was such a great quote. And it was a long quote. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe we'll go right to Deborah Lee Baldwin. Stay with us uh, after these messages on Biz Talk Radio. Okay, we are back. Thank you for uh, hanging in there. As uh, we always uh, inquire, hope it was a, a good break for you. We'd like to know how the break was, be it Biz Talk Radio or just watching us between breaks here on Facebook Live. Anyway, back with the fellas here. It is uh, Garden America. Happy weekend to you. Tiger Palafox. I'm Brian Main. John Bignasco. Right now, going to toss to Tiger. Going to bring in our lovely, great guest, Deborah Lee Baldwin. Tiger? Yeah, this morning we have our friend Deborah Lee Baldwin joining us to talk about um, what she's been up to over the past year and also her new calendars that are coming up, which are great gift ideas coming <clears> into the holidays and just about succulents in general. Good morning, Deborah Lee. Thank you for joining us. Well, good morning to all, all of you. It's good to be watching you on <laughs> Facebook. Uh, what a treat to hear from you and to hear that you're excited about this year's calendars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um it's a hobby of mine, and it's just such a delight to be able to um, get them out there, get them seen. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think that over the years, you know, your, your background as a, um, as a photographer, right, um, a, yeah. a garden photographer, obviously led you into, you know, other hobbies. And, you know, you talked about watercolors and, and painting and you know, and then, you know, to take these images and put them into a calendar for people to enjoy throughout the year is a wonderful thing. And, you know, not only do they have great information uh, or not only are they great photographs or, or watercolors, but, you know, they have the variety of the plants that they are or kind of the location. Because I think, you know, for any, you know, most gardeners, they're going to want to know, oh, that's a really neat plant. Yeah. What is what that? What is it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, you have all of those listed right there and ready to go for people. Well, that, that's, uh, that's one thing I've, I've tried to do from the very beginning of my career. I remember Pat Welsh told me, uh, you know, when you do your book, be sure you identify the plants in the photos. Evidently, that was a pet peeve of hers that she <laughs> would get a gardening book, and the photos were great, but, you know, she had to look up the plants on her own. And it does take that much more work to... Track, not only track down the names, but also get them right, get them spelled right. Um, I had quite the challenge, you know, back when I was writing the first edition of Designing with Succulents, because there were a lot of names out there that were questionable. Oh, like um, 
Kellen Coey Thirsa Flora was what Kellen Coey Lucier was labeled back then. Uh-huh. And there were nurserymen who were going to, you know, take me to a mat on that <laughs> one because they'd had a zillion labels printed. <laughs> Well, well, you know, it's so you know, it's so funny about but that. Anyway, it is, it is important. It it is because um, it's so funny about the naming thing. Is you know, we used to do a lot of um, uh, home shows where you know you would set up garden exhibits and you put plants into it, and you know, as a as a nurseryman, you would sit there and it's sometimes hard to identify every plant. So you would be like, oh, these are the ones that people are going to ask about. You yeah. know, these are the ones I'm going to put the names on because people are going to ask about these plants in this exhibit. But no matter what, they'd always ask, you know, even the even the most common little plant that you're like, why are you asking me the name on that? You can find it anywhere, but they want to know what it is. And, you know, so name on plants is very important because you you never know what's going to pique someone's interest, right? Yeah, and it's like getting to know a person. You know, you see them, they look interesting to you, uh, you start learning a little bit about them. And you want to know their name. And it's, it's nice to know the horticultural name, uh, but it's pretty much you can get by with the common names, although that's controversial. You know, I, <laughs> I remember when the, the, the first galleys came back of my book, and I had them spread out on the uh, dining room table because I was so proud. And my son, who was living at home at the time, I think he was in his late teens, um, he said, yeah, Mom, it's a great-looking book, but <laughs> how come you didn't use common names? <laughs> and you know why? Because back then, Timber Press wanted horticultural names. And I went the extra mile and took a tremendous amount of time and effort tracking down correct botanical names for all the plants I showed and occasionally threw in a common name if it was important. Well, by the time my third book for Timber Press came out, they wanted common names. <laughs> so it was kind of going from the more intellectual, horticultural, uh, studious approach to the more people-friendly. And, yeah, throw in the botanic name. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think common names are like nicknames. Yeah. You know, you can call yeah. somebody Tiger, but you really want to know the his first and last <laughs> name. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and that's what botanical names yeah. are. Yeah, and like, you know, I mean, the common names are a common name because... <clears throat> because it, nobody it, can pronounce the other name. Well, <laughs> not just that, but, I mean, they could be for a number of things. You know, honeysuckle. Let's, let's, let's throw out honeysuckle out there, right? You know how many different honeysuckles there are, but there's, what, maybe five different botanical honeysuckles that are all honeysuckle, but botanically they're very different plants mm-hmm. and... But people love to call them honeysuckle, and um, you know it's very hard to pinpoint that exact plant. When we were when we were touring England, John, that was a one of the things, right? We would go with these tour guys, and they would say, "Oh, well, here in England, we call this right. whatever." And we're right. like, "Okay, well, you know that doesn't help us in the United States <laughs> because you know uh, it's a very different plant." Well, even different parts of the country. Uh, the first book I wrote was on house plants, and in the Midwest. Uh, the, one of the most common indoor plants was Swedish ivy. In California, they call it Creeping Charlie. Uh, yeah. yeah. But Creeping Charlie in Michigan was a pilea, <laughs> something <laughs> completely different. So, yeah. so really, if you want to know exactly what a plant is, I think the scientific names are important. And, and Deborah, why can't everybody take a couple years of Latin and Greek? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I took two years of Latin, uh, wondering the entire time why, and <laughs> I'm very glad I did, and now I wish they'd thrown in some Greek. Yeah. That would have been helpful, too. But but back to Creeping Charlie, um, do you think that's a succulent? Ooh. The Plectranthus? Yeah. It sure feels like it, huh? <laughs> it, it's, it's on the fence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Literally. let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. What sounds worse, creeping Charlie or peeping Tom? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, there we Brian. have a question from Brian. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Deborah. Um, regarding the calendars, I've always wondered about putting together a calendar, and you know, why you picked the pictures 
for the months that you have. Oh, and we do have about a minute left of this segment, so I might have to cut you off in the middle of this, but just heads Oh, up. yeah. Well, I won't go through all 24 images. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes something's shaped like a heart, and it oh. seems appropriate for February. Sometimes something looks lacy, like a mammillaria plumosa, and that might work for June. I try to get something that looks like a uh, oh, star for, for December. But, um, yeah, it's, okay. it's just very arbitrary. <laughs> nice. Nice. Oh, good way to do it. All right. When we get back, we're going to continue talking with Deborah Lee Baldwin, and we'll be talking about her uh, upcoming videos on YouTube and what right. she already has and about more succulent stuff. So. so do stay with us. I see a question on the Facebook Live. So if you want to uh, answer or I should say ask your question or make a comment, uh, please do so on our Facebook page right there in the comment section. And we'll address it with uh, Deborah Lee Baldwin when we return. And again, this is Garden America. Welcome to the weekend. Good to have Deborah along. I'm Brian Main, John Bagnasker, Tiger Palafox. Do stay with us. We're going to take a break for our friends on BizTalk Radio. Okay, we have returned. This will be a, a longer segment here, so plenty of time for your questions, your comments, as we continue our conversation with a good friend of the show, Deborah Lee Baldwin. Good to be back with you on this weekend. John Bagnasco, Brian Main, Tiger Palafox. We continue, Tiger, with Deborah Lee Baldwin. Yeah, and as I mentioned before the break, Deborah Lee has a wonderful YouTube channel where she has videos that talk about uh, succulent crafts, uh, some containers, um, projects, large and small. And one of our friends, Susan, um, from the program, sent me a video that you did um, where she converted her fish pond into a succulent garden. And um, I, I, the name escapes me. I know it's Laura Eubank's daughter. Um, I don't remember her name, no. though. Yeah, it's Anna Eubanks. Anna, Anna Eubanks was the one doing the design and the layout for it. Um, now, when I watched that video, I have to say – it's almost as if, you know, a Sunset magazine was doing an article on a, on some kind of planting. Um, you did that in video form where you're showing the process, you're talking to the designer, you're talking to the homeowner. You, you've got all these cool little tips and tricks and information about why they did what and why they used what. So that if somebody's looking to do a project big or small – you, you probably have a video on your YouTube channel that covers yeah. it, right? <laughs> well, and and uh, just a shout out to Susan, who is a longtime good friend and a fan of the show, and has traveled with you, and and uh, and uh, very active in the San Diego Horticultural Society as a volunteer in past years. So, uh, yeah. Oh, where should I start? You know, <laughs> I used to be San Diego scout for Sunset Magazine. And I also wrote for San Diego Home Garden and Sunset and other publications like Better Homes and Gardens. So that was probably, you know, of all the things I've done in my entire career, the most fun because I would discover creative talent and oh, homeowners that had a lot of foresight who would hire these great designers. And I would be the one who would go and take scouting photos and show them to my editors and then get assignments to write about them and to try to generate the same excitement and interest and also provide practical tips for the readers. And I would set up photo shoots. Well, that was, you know, back around the turn of the millennium. And it was probably the most exciting and fun thing I ever did in my life. And I did it for about a decade. And then I went on to write the books, yeah. which was maybe even better. I don't know. One of these days I'll, I'll have to sit down and really give that some thought. But <laughs> what I love doing now that I'm semi-retired is to return to that delightful time in my life where I go to homeowners and see what they've done and who they've hired and talk to up-and-coming talent and take photos that illustrate the whole you know, not only the beauty and the aesthetics, but also talk about the problems that were solved. Mm. So here we have uh, Susan, who is a longtime terrific gardener who had a koi pond that she decided, you know, it was time to get rid of. 
And there was a lot in her history of ocean, uh, you know, fishing and going to Mexico and bringing back great uh, souvenirs and shells and things. And so she um, she talked to, let's see, I'm not sure how it happened, but, you know, Laura Eubanks is one of San Diego's top succulent designers. And her daughter works very closely with her, and they have a fantastic, extremely popular YouTube channel. Laura Eubanks uh, actually shows hands-on how she does plants and goes to clients' homes. and I mean, it's terrific. And then there's Hannah, who is young and beautiful and gorgeous and who has just absorbed all of her mother's talent and awareness and plant knowledge. And she's absolutely delightful, gorgeous on camera, and she's starting to branch out a little bit on her own. Well, I was on her like a hound on a, on a meatball. <laughs> I mean, she was just, <laughs> she's just so, oh, everything that the gardening world needs. She's such a breath of fresh air. And she's got great potential yeah. to be that spokesperson for great design and using succulents. Yeah. So, not, I mean, Laura did a video on Susan's garden, and, and that's, you know, definitely watch that on Laura's channel. And she's the proud mom. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, hey, everybody, you know, yeah. look at Hannah Eubanks. Yeah, that and is. And she's absolutely fantastic. I know, can't say enough good things about her. You know, it's it's a it's a great video. And, you know, kind of back to the idea of your videos is the reason why I tell people wherever you're at, to go on garden tours. You know, a lot of garden clubs across the country put on garden tours and you get to go in people's backyards and you get to see, um, you know, what they've done with the space that they have. And for some yards, they're large estates. For some people, it's a small little compact backyard in an urban environment. But everybody's worked with what they have and, you know, you get inspiration. Um, and, you know, for, for years, magazines and you know, by no means am I trying to put down what, what you've done in the past. They show the the best. You know, they take the photo at the ideal time. Um, you know, the ideal angle. They eliminate maybe a, a shed or some kind of background in it. And so you you're looking through a magazine and your mind just runs wild with with imagination, right? And ideas. On close ups, they pull off the dead leaves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, you. Um, why can't my plants look like that? Web. Yeah. yeah, but um, in your video, it's it's almost as if you're on a garden tour because you're walking with you and the designer and the homeowner through their landscape, and you're showing it all. You're showing everything they've used, like you say, the mistakes and how they worked around it, or the little things that they've had to do. Oh, maybe there was a a, a water box here, or. A, you know, electric uh, outlet here. We got to hide it somehow or something. Um, and so I feel people, no matter if they do have a small garden or a big garden, your videos show it as if they're on a garden tour. And I think that's well, really neat for people thank to you. see. Yeah. And, and for some of that, you know, practical stuff, like, you know, like florists say, hide your mechanic. <laughs> well, you don't, you don't want uh, some utilitarian thing drawing the eye yeah you don't want it in your sight line you don't want it as a focal point point. and what we tend to do is have familiarity blindness we know that that utility box cannot be moved and is a permanent fixture therefore we just sort of ignore it like it's not there you bring in a designer with with a fresh eye and they will conceal it or draw the eye away from it if you want to do that on your own Here's a trick. You get the biggest mirror you can carry. Hand mirror is fine. You go outside. You turn your back to a garden that you've seen a million times. You no longer see it. And look at it through the mirror. Everything's reversed. And things will jump out at you like, oh, my gosh. There's a utility box on the wall right behind my, you know, favorite plant. <laughs> okay, plant the, or, uh, paint the utility box so it disappears into the wall. Simple solution. There's so many of those great little tricks that designers have. So it's one of the reasons why I like to follow what designers are doing. And I also see great things that homeowners have come up with on their own. There's a lot of innovation out there. 
but anyway, that that's oh, it's such a joy to be able to take people through a great garden, and as a result of the training I've had, to say, okay, you know, evaluate the orientation to the uh, east, south, north, and, and west. So, what are your plants going to want? And I'm about to show you uh, my own deck redo. I have <laughs> huh. a 250-square-foot deck uh, outside my dining room and kitchen, and it has 70 pots wow. on it, all planted with succulents. And I finally got around to redoing them. You know, it's one of those things where I didn't want to look out there, but then <laughs> hey, people were coming over, and hey, hey, oh, Debra. there's nothing like guests for Debra, a deadline. Before- Deborah, are you there? Sorry. Um, before you get too much into it, I do want to say we do have to take another break. Sorry to interrupt. When we get back, we will continue uh, chatting with Deborah Lee Baldwin about her deck redo project. Um, but we do have to take a break right now. Right. And I, I guess, John, we have one question so far from Rick uh, for we Deborah. Have three questions. So, okay, well, three questions. Questions or comments. Okay, good. So right. we'll get to those as well. So do stay with us. And again, uh, if you haven't already, then uh, feel free to do so. Whatever comes to your mind, questions, comments. From one of us or Deborah Lee Baldwin. As Tiger mentioned, we're going to take a break. We have one more segment coming up if you're tuned in on BizTalk Radio until the top of the hour, which will give you news at that time. For the rest of us on Facebook, it'll be a quicker break. We'll be right back. Again, these messages on BizTalk Radio. Stay with us. We are back from the break. Those on BizTalk Radio, thank you for tuning in each week. This is a pre-recorded show from last week. You've got news coming up top of the hour. If your market does carry us for the second hour, we return at six minutes after. Uh, This morning, uh, the conversation is with our good friend, good friend of the show, Deborah Lee Baldwin, talking uh, about succulents and plants in general as we continue our conversation. And again, we do apologize, uh, Deborah Lee, for having to uh, cut things off there to go to the break to fulfill our network obligations. Yeah, and you were just describing your, was it 200-square-foot patio that had 70 containers on it full of 70 just containers. Wonderful, wonderful plants. And, I'm and sure. so I gave an awful lot of thought to, you know, the orientation to the sun because some of those plants will get scorched in summer. I'm in north San Diego County at an elevation of 1,500 feet. I get blazing hot sun in the summer, and, you know, plants can't pull up the roots and run, they have to be protected or they come up with their own methods of uh, sun protection. Like the succulents, crassulas, and aloes will turn red, which pushes pigment to the surface, which is like a sunscreen. So, And I want that. I want that look. So maybe I'll put them over by the east railing. And then there's other. So the point being is I'm going to go through my deck renovation and the plants and pots that I've redone. I'll talk about plant pot pairings, what looks good in what pot and why, how to do groupings, how to have a lot of little pots without it looking jumbled and cluttered and being underfoot. So lots of good stuff there. But I think you want to get to Rick's question. Rick, you asked what type of succulents will grow in colder climate. Well, (laughs) oh, my friend Rick, how I wish I could (laughs) tell you that there was a way to grow everything in a colder climate. (laughs) Greenhouse, yeah. But, you know, keep in mind that succulents are from arid, warm climates. And the farther north you go, when the temperatures get down to freezing, the fewer the succulents you'll be able to grow. And they also tend to get smaller, so they're not as interesting and dramatic. That said, there are uh, sempervivums are wonderful little rosette succulents that are colony-forming. They'll do well for you. There are sedums that will thrive in colder climate. Some of these plants actually prefer them. Um, I have a great relationship with a mail-order nursery, Mountain Crest Gardens. I think they're the best. They're family-owned. And the owner came here to Southern California. They're up in uh, Northern California, and they grew everything in greenhouses. He came. He came here, and checked on the sempervivums that he had sent me, because <laughs> I trialed them in my own garden. Those things looked terrible, <laughs> and I like to think I know what I'm doing. I've got a half acre. I grew everything in my books, but they looked terrible. And I'm like, I don't understand. 
you know, these are supposed to be the Joba Barbas and all. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to be thriving here. What's wrong? They don't get enough cold at night. So it's it's a it's something that I can't do anything about unless I create a climate controlled situation indoors that is maybe going to lower those nighttime temperatures. It's also going to give them the full spectrum light they need that simulates sun, sunlight during the day. So in a nutshell, Rick, <laughs> you can grow any plant on the planet <laughs> if you replicate its native growing conditions and you're willing to take the trouble to do it. Yeah, there you go. And that's a that's kind of a rare thing. And, you know, people being like, oh, how am I going to simulate the cold <laughs> of an environment here in Southern California? But you if, know what? But if you want oh. to, you can. And you know what the hardest thing is? Climates with humidity. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can keep you can cover your plants, you can keep them warm, you can do all kinds of things. But one thing you really can't control is humidity, and the echeverias you'd think would grow really well in Florida and Hawaii. <laughs> not so much, especially not in Florida. They, they're just not set up to handle that kind of humidity. And when you think about it, most succulents are from very low, humid climate. Yeah. So, they're, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a failure kind of built into the whole thing. Yeah. I wish you know, it went that way. I remember the first time I went to Hawaii. Um, uh, I get I have the image in my mind now because we went to visit succulent gardens, and uh, it was an attempt at a succulent garden. But to me, it looked like the whole landscape was melting. It just <laughs> looked yeah. pathetic, well, and it's because I, I, of the humidity you're discussing. Yeah, and some uh, some succulents are just tougher and better at adapting to less than ideal climates. And you know what I saw a lot of in Hawaii? And I was, I was thinking, gosh, these plants are gorgeous here, was agave attenuata. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the foxtail agave, the smooth-leaved green agave that is so prolific along the California coast. It doesn't, <clears throat> it doesn't do real well inland because it's very frost tender and literally melts. Mm -hmm. But there in Hawaii... You know, it's like the pozos. It's yeah. Like, God, heavens, those things grow large here. Yeah, and, <laughs> and they're the kind of plant that just fall off of the back of a truck and will root somewhere. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of it's kind of nice like that for sure. By the way, Rick is in Star, Idaho, and um, I, you didn't mention it, Deborah, but if he goes to your website, uh, as I recall, you had uh, a discussion on cold hardy succulents. In yes. cacti. Uh, and so if you go there, Rick, and um, I, I think you'll get some great ideas from Deborah. Yeah. Well, and what I'll do um, when I can actually, you know, get to my keyboard <laughs> is uh, put these links in there. So oh, good. where Rick's comment is under reply, uh -huh. I'll put a link to that. Wow. That'll, that wow. Hopefully he'll find helpful. Yeah. Personalized attention. Yeah, doing a lot of our work for us. We appreciate that. <laughs> Gina, who's I, get, I get questions from all over the world. Well, Gina, who's also in Idaho, uh, mentions to grow them in pots and bring them indoors for the winter. <laughs> yes, and you know, Gina, thank you. That that of course, that is one of those obvious things that I skipped right past. Yeah. Uh, you know your climate, and you can grow wonderful uh, succulents. In fact, one nurseryman up in Idaho told me. Just grow them as annuals. Yeah. You know, if you don't want to, if you don't want to bring them indoors in the winter, uh, just consider them annuals. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Hey, we're gonna have to take another break. When we get back, we'll continue chatting with Deborah Lee. Um, and uh, this will be our last spot chatting, so make sure you get your questions yep, in. absolutely. And uh, those on Biz Talk Radio tuning in, news coming up top of the hour. If you do get our show the second hour, we come back at six minutes after. We will continue our conversation and wrap things up with Deborah Lee Baldwin. So do stay with us. Welcome to Garden America. Happy weekend or whenever you're listening to the show. Brian Maine, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. And again, back after news and these messages on Biz Talk Radio. Stay with us.
All righty, we have returned. Uh, we welcome those uh, back on BizTalk Radio, or perhaps you're just uh, joining us on BizTalk Radio. Thank you so much. A pre-recorded show from last week. We continue with our guest, Deborah Lee Baldwin. Welcome to Garden America. John Bagnesco, Brian Maine, Tiger Palafox. Tiger, uh, we flip it back to you and continue with Deborah. Yeah, before the break, we were just talking about how to grow plants that would not grow well in your environment. And Deborah, you you do have a calendar out, succulents with spirals, that probably has my uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a nemesis plant, but it is a <laughs> it, it is a plant that has inspired me to make multiple attempts to grow unsuccessfully. On um, and it's because you know it is a spiral plant. It's the um, aloe polyphyla, the 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 spiral aloe, and you have it on the cover of this beautiful um, succulent with spirals. Um, calendar but that is one that i have had multiple times where i bought and i'm like this is going to be the chance this is going to be the time because it, it's just such a neat looking plant but um i haven't been able to make it succeed yet but um i it, it, hopefully this calendar will inspire me one more time it is the holy grail of succulents <laughs> it it is probably the most photogenic succulent uh it it speaks to that deep love we have of the the um, the Fibonacci spiral, which is found throughout nature all the way into hurricanes and galaxies. There's something so compelling. We're just like hardwired <laughs> to appreciate that innate beauty. And no succulent does it quite as well as a spiral aloe. But <laughs> it, it is a heartbreaker. I yes. mean, I have a whole category of succulents that I call heartbreakers. <laughs> Because they are beautiful and desirable, or maybe they're just rare, or maybe you've never seen them before and you just really want it. And they, for whatever reason, <laughs> would we'll just break your heart. Yeah. I mean, I think about the moon cacti that people are often attracted to. Those things are doomed to failure. <laughs> and lithops, oh yes. my goodness, the, yes. the living stones so. are just so seductive. And down they go for no particular reason. It's like Tiger it's going a, back to... Back to that relationship, he keeps hoping it'll work. It yeah. never does. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, uh, how many times are you going to try? I, I figure uh, I give something three times. If it dies on me every time, it was not meant to be. Yeah. But, I mean, I can go on about spiral aloes. Right. Uh, I don't know if you want me to. But they, yes. you know, they, they come from the high elevations of Lesotho in South Africa. And they grow... Um, so that they're facing out, so that they're they're actually on vertical surfaces. They their roots are bathed by snow melt. Now I don't know if you want to try to replicate all of those <laughs> conditions. Yeah. But there is a fabulous uh, expert in spiral aloe, Alan Beverly in uh, Northern California in the Bay Area, and he provided succulent gardens. Um, in Castroville with a lot of spiral aloes. Well, sadly, they all got, I think it was some kind of fungus and oh. went down. Yeah, it, that happened after I photographed them all and, you know, showed them to the world and everybody wanted them. <laughs> and, now... and it was this oh, heartbreaking yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 But, but um... sometimes you can get them. Yeah. And if you can't get them, you can get Deborah's calendar that has a picture of it. Yeah, there you go. Wonderful. That's the next best thing. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful picture of it for sure. And By the uh, way, what tip on those, Tiger, is that you don't think of this with uh, other cacti and succulents, but that prefers acid soils. Oh. So, so like an azalea mix to I go with mean, it, huh? Well, I don't know about an azalea mix, but something to acidify the soil because okay. it still needs the perfect drainage. Like Deborah's yeah. saying, they grow in vertical okay. cliffs. So there's and, a there's a wall at SeaWorld in their polar bear exhibit that has melting ice. Maybe I can replicate there that in my house yeah. and <laughs> just go from there. Well, if you can grow one, you can't really just grow one because there's a <coughs> excuse me a, a clockwise spiral and yeah. a counterclockwise spiral. Oh, you need them both. So you need both. Oh, yeah. goodness yeah, gracious! Yeah, that's that's the ultimate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the ultimate gardener right there can grow the clockwise and counterclockwise right. ones, huh? Carla mentions that she's just going to stick to the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Deborah, uh, lots of great information. Um, 
beautiful calendars. I put the link for people to be able to find um, the calendars and also wonderful other gift ideas coming up through the holiday. I did put the link to um, – Hannah Eubanks' video that she did, which also takes uh, our listeners to your YouTube channel um, to find out for more uh, videos. And, um, yeah, we will keep in touch. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Well, thank you for having me. And I am going to add some links in response to what some of the listeners have requested. Awesome. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Yeah, great information. And, uh, again, always learning something new. And, uh it did pique the interest of a lot of our viewers and listeners, obviously. Yeah, always does. Oh, well, how about that, huh? Kind of coming down you, after that, right? <laughs> do you have succulents in your in your patio, Brian? I have little ones. Do you? Um, At one time, you had a, a succulent garden that was created by Deborah oh, actually, just for you. Yeah, yeah. I do. And they're, and they're hanging baskets, and yeah. I still have them. Oh, that's right. That's oh, do you really? Oh. The bird nest was in one. Absolutely. That goes back, John, eight, nine years, and I still have them. And they still bloom. They've got little flowers on them. Oh, what about the moon cactus that was in there? They're dead, right? The ones that had the the uh, colored tops, they were grafted like oh, red yeah. and yellow. Oh, yeah. You know, those come and go. Yeah. Like Deborah said, they're doomed to failure. But you know what else? <laughs> but what I still have is the wedding gift that you and Sharon gave us. You had a little succulent arrangement in a, in a box with a radio. We had that specially made. Yeah. And it's still, some of them have died, but, but most of them are still blooming. And, you know, succulents, you just, you, you leave them alone, but you check on them every now and then. Yeah. You don't want to overwater them, which I learned early on with the root rot. But just kind of let them do their thing. Right. They're, they're, they can and, sustain on their own pretty well. So, you know, I have this um, Thanksgiving cactus. I forget the botanical name of it now. Zygo cactus. Zygo cactus. Yes. Right. Zygo cactus. Or not the Schlumbergia. No. Sure. Schlumbergia. No. No Schlumbergia. Oh, Schlumbergia. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a Christmas. Christmas cactus. cactus. No, right. it's a Thanksgiving one. All right. And um, it it definitely isn't doing well because I don't really take that great like care of it, but it's not dying, you know. And that's sometimes what succulents do, is they might not thrive. They're just there, you know. But it didn't die on you. And, right. and every once in a while you see it and you're like, ooh, you're on the verge of death. And then you just give <laughs> it a little bit of water and it's like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm here again. Don't worry about mm-hmm. me. Give me another yeah. year. I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. I should take a picture of, the, of those hanging baskets that, that we put together. You should. That was at Altman's, I believe, right? Yeah, we had a, a show up there, Escondido, north of Escondido. At wa- uh, water, water, not water, water, was no. it Waterwise? No, no, it was uh, Oasis. 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 Yeah, right. Yeah, that was fun, yeah. and that goes back maybe maybe ten years from now because it was back in 2010 or 11 that uh, Bruce, you and me, and Sharon went up to uh, Chico, and uh, we spent the night up there with the uh, the pecan uh, trees behind us. It was right. like a bed and breakfast. Right. Wow. Ten years oh. just like that. Candied pecans, they're amazing. And it was cold. It gets cold up there, hot and cold. Yeah, Chico. Yep. Yep. That's what they. That's why they grow what they grow. By the way, back to our discussion on uh, on uh, botanical nomenclature. Oh. Carla says she finally knows how to pronounce Kalanchoe. because <laughs> most people say Kalancho, Kalancho. right? That's what it yeah. looks like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And. I think people would still know what you meant. Yeah, and to say it, you know, right or wrong is tomato, tomato, and oh yeah, you know, absolutely different. You know, they we're because I tend to think other people pronounce things correctly more than we do in America. And Deborah just posted that it's okay to say Calancho. Yeah, it is. So there you go. <laughs> right. If you have permission from Deborah, you the, can the call it whatever you want. Yeah. You so, have. so here's a word. Would you say template or template? You know, that is one of those words. It's definitely when I'm speaking, it comes out differently different times. I don't know why, but whatever I'm saying in a sentence mm-hmm. dictates how I say it. I think I think we tend to get a little lazy here in this country. I think it's probably template. Mm-hmm. We say template. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, template. I always say template. Template? Yeah. Yeah. And not by watching videos of people in Canada, you know, so on and so forth, they're talking about various things, and I repeatedly they say template. Yeah. Or, Do you or, say schedule or schedule? Schedule. <laughs> schedule is schedule. is European England. Yeah. But schedule, right. yeah, right. Schedule. But you said, you know, patio, patio, tomato, tomato. Yeah. Still tastes good. 
<laughs> yeah. And and that's why, you know, the Latin botanical are actually kind of better because you pronounce it how it you pronounce it how it is. Right. They you know, it's the root of the word, so therefore it's that's exactly how you say it. It's kind of easy where in English we mix up letters. And you and, also pronounce things the way your parents spoke in the oh house yeah. when oh you yeah. were growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, because I remember going to school hearing, you know, my mother was an English major. I'd go to school <laughs> and they would say things and go, well, well, they say it this way. She goes, that's not correct. Yeah. It, this is the way it's pronounced. Just <laughs> like the word, do you say amateur or amateur? Amateur. amateur. It's amateur. Amateur. Amateur is the way, is, is, is the way. Yep. And here's something else, and we'll get off this. We all, we all <laughs> say detail, right? Give me the details. Right. It's detail. Detail, detail is what they do to your car. And if you watch an old movie or old TV shows, they pronounce those things correctly, just like I mentioned. Well, like news broadcasters had to go well, to yeah, and we, for all of that. We had to learn that when I was in radio yeah. school. They yeah. go, hey, it's not Tuesday, it's Tuesday. Oh, what's the well, difference? Well, don't you get your car detailed in Detroit? <laughs> and or I've do heard you people, get it detailed in Detroit? I've heard that as well, and we are running late. I've got to do some editing here. When we it's come cement, back on Monday, not cement. we're going to take a break because we are running late, but sounding great here on Garden America. Okay, we have returned. It is uh, Brian Main and John Bagnasco. Tiger has his last soccer game today. You know, Tiger's not playing soccer, but his son is. Isaac. S Isaac. So he's heading back down to Chula Vista for that soccer game. So for the rest of the program, we've got uh, one, two, three segments left. It'll be John and myself. So feel free. Questions, comments. Want to refer back to Deborah Lee Baldwin. I'm sure she's still on Facebook on our page. And she's very gracious to put links up there and actually do, do a lot of the legwork and heavy lifting for us. And for that, we thank you, Deborah Lee Baldwin, a great guest. We'll have her on again uh, sometime in the near future, hopefully early next year, John. Yeah. It's You're speechless. Almost, well, You're speechless. I, I, the thought just entered my mind. It's almost early next year. Wow. November. Yeah. November and then December. Of course, we've been watching Christmas commercials since October, so God, every <laughs> we year. We had that nice uh, rain this week, and everything is greening up. It's the time of year. It washed all the dirt off the plants. You know, we went all summer. They're coated with dust. Don't you feel, well, yeah. not you necessarily because you have 10,000 plants, but I feel much more low maintenance when it rains. I go out. Everyone's oh, been taken care of. Everything's watered. Low maintenance. I water every day, right? Mm -hmm. And I've gone three days without watering fifteen hundred roses. And and we get it so gave me time to to actually do some planting. We get so used to in the summertime when it's hot, maintaining our plants and making sure they're watered and sweeping and this and that. And I look outside and there's no leaves that have fallen necessarily, and uh, plants have plenty of water. So this is a good time of the year. The days are shorter, obviously, so you're not going to get that summer heat whenever there is a bit of heat this time of year. Right. Um, early in the show, we were talking about Michigan State, uh, right. my old alma, alma mater, and they had a botanical garden in Michigan State uh, outdoors called Beale Gardens. And I was majoring in horticulture marketing my senior year there, so I had a lot of plant ID Horticultural courses. marketing, the, yeah. the two combined. Yeah. How, to, how to market plants? Right. And you know, when I graduated, there was only one country or one country, one company in the country that could use a horticultural marketer. <laughs> and I got ended up getting a job with them. You know, 
That sounds so specialized. I mean, obviously, there's marketing, and you can major in horticultural, but combining those two. You know why they did that was because I was majoring in accounting. And, and I told you this story many times. I just know you flunked out of chemistry class, but go ahead. That was University of Michigan. But uh, I was majoring in accounting at um, Michigan State. Uh, and my thinking was, well, I'll get a job. When I graduate, I'm sure I could get a job, right? But my junior year, I was sitting in class, and the thought entered me, entered into my mind, I could end up doing this the rest of my life, and I hate everything about it. Wow. And I was living with 15 other guys in a co-op, and one of the guys was majoring in horticulture. And I would help him with his homework every night. And it, the thought entered, you know, this isn't fair. I hate what I'm doing. And I'm helping him with what he's doing, and I love it. So I, I walked out of the class, went to talk to my counselor. And he said, well, he says, you're going to be a senior next year. It's too late to get a, a horticulture of science major. He said, why don't we get you a degree in horticultural marketing because you won't have to take any business courses. Your senior year, you can take just horticulture classes. And did you have any business courses prior to that? Well, all my accounting courses. All the accounting. So that, right. that, I had that, marketing. I had accounting. That qualified you, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I did that. I ended up getting a four-point my senior year. It raised my grade point average to where I, I graduated with honors just because of the I was doing something I liked. So let, let's say um, you You know had, what I would have to do when I was taking my business courses? I would take a course like Greek just so I could raise my average. <laughs> <laughs> So if you, let's say you had another 75 years on the planet and you could either. No, there's no chance. I'd be 100 and almost 50. But let's say you could either continue to do what you're doing now or based on life experiences and your history, what would you do different? I'd sit back and enjoy the garden because I think by then the roses would have all been planted. <laughs> would you do the same thing again? Because I look back, I go, yes, I'm in radio. I've done this. But but you along the way, different. but but along the way, I've been exposed to certain things that are really too late to get into. Basically, yeah. there's things that I, I would probably stay in the same business, mm -hmm. but there was things I might take a chance on that I I Didn't passed before. up in the past. Right. You know, like after I moved to California, I think I told you this. I had a a uh, call from Good Morning America, and they wanted me to move to New York and do a in Beyond Good Morning America doing a uh, gardening sec segment. And this was what, 70s, 80s? It would have been 1978. Okay, all right. And, it, and they said, um, you know, w we've talked to someone who recommended you. Could you just send us uh, a cassette? Uh, what were they called back then? Well, they, they wanted like, tape. like a video or air check of, of, of what you would look like and sound like. And, and they wanted you to move to New York just to do a small segment on Good Morning America. Well, I would be on the show, so it would be a regular show, a regular spot right, on it, the show. But not very long, obviously. It's a segment. Right, right. Okay. These days, you wouldn't have to move to New York. You, right. could, you could do it from your home on your computer and, and still fulfill the same obligation. There's one thing, though, that does, wouldn't work. They don't want me anymore. Well... <laughs> <laughs> okay, and those people aren't around anymore. But anyway, getting back to the story, right. you, this never, this never came to fruition. <laughs> well, no, because uh, you know back then they didn't. Who had a movie camera? Who could make a, a tape of what you were doing? Mm -hmm. I, that's that stuff was just starting. Right, I didn't sure. know where to get one. I didn't have a. Uh, what were they called? Camcorders back then. Yeah, but they didn't even have camcorders back then. My my first video camera that I bought in the mid '80s was huge. I have it on my shoulder, yeah, yeah. and whenever I would go out someplace, people would stop and stare. What's he doing? What's he videotaping? It was such a novelty. It's no big deal now. You know, plus I had only been in California for about three months, maybe four months, and, and I had moved here from Michigan. You know, the move from Michigan to New York would not have been as far. Right. Uh, and I kind of wanted to – I like the weather in California. You want to do it. Right. This kind of sounds like me when I was – 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, I would spend my summers in Canada every mm -hmm. summer playing hockey, learning from the best. Yeah. And after the second year, they said, 
you know, uh, for a kid from California that can skate like that, would he be interested in moving here, living with a family? And he would play hockey. We would, that's what he would do. Right. My mother says, do you want to do that? And I went, no, I want to go home and be with my friends. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, so. So you might do that now, though, right? Oh, boy, I don't Maybe. know. Maybe. Who knows? Because life experiences change your, your psyche when you become this age. Right. And you look back and. And definitely, I'm more confident than I was before. You talked about confidence and in, right. in doing things, and I think that that does change. But then in sports, you have injuries, like you hurt your back, right? So oh, you, my back is totally messed up. Yeah, you couldn't work if you totally. Or, or couldn't have done that. We're going to take a break for our friends on Biz Talk Radio. Those on Facebook Live, yes, it's a dwindle down to John and myself, Tiger, with his last uh, Sun Soccer game today. So do stay with us. Any questions, comments? Deborah Lee, I believe, is still active on Facebook, and we do appreciate that. So with that in mind, we have, uh, let's see, two segments to go. We're going to take a break. Brian Maine, John Bagnasco here on Garden America. Welcome to the show. John and I have returned. We are back on BizTalk Radio. Again, no, we do encourage you, those listening on BizTalk Radio, Facebook Live, do visit our website. If you can just click in and check in once a day, we would really appreciate it. It helps our show, helps our algorithms. It helps everything about us in terms of the show continuing to be successful. So that's uh, GardenAmerica.com. You want to watch uh, shows, obviously, go to our website, GardenAmerica.com. You can click and watch previous shows. You can ask Alexa to play Garden America Radio. She will do that. You can also go to our YouTube page, Garden America Radio Show. All the shows are there for your enjoyment, streaming, digital, radio, video, or everywhere, John. I don't think they're all there for your enjoyment. There's a couple that are meant to just teach you, and we don't expect you to enjoy them. And some are, are just there to antagonize you as well. Yeah. So if that's what you're into, that's what you want. I mean, there you go. We try to fulfill uh, every opportunity we can. Hey, you know, last segment I got sidetracked because I started telling you about Beale Gardens at Michigan State University. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and how I was uh, in horticulture my senior year. And one of the things that fascinated me was, uh, and this is for Rick in Idaho, was they had cactus growing in their garden. And not a lot. There were some very uh, hardy varieties of opuntia. So they would take Michigan temperatures uh, down to, what, 15, 20 below zero sometimes. These were succulents? They were cactus. Okay, which is? Cacti. Right. Um, Not all succulent cactus, but all cactus is succulent. Is that right? All cactus are succulents. Okay. Not all succulents are cacti. So anyway, um, you could do that. And it also uh, amazed me that there was a flying d dragon citrus growing there, too. So a very, it's used as a rootstock in California, but a very hardy uh, rootstock. So anyway, I guess the point of this, Rick, is there are some hardy cactus and succulents that you could experiment with in your garden. What would be different about the way they grow, the cell structure that would allow them to take those temperatures? You know, they come from parts of the world, um, maybe South American countries that have really cold winters but are deserts um, like Patagonia and places like that. So they've developed that over the years because of the right. environment. Right. The the With most succulents, the problem is that when they freeze, the cell walls burst. Right. So they just turn to mush, right? Mm -hmm. But the Semper Vivums that, uh, that Deborah was talking about are little – the hens and chicks is a common name for people who like the common names. Um, hens and chicks? Hens and chicks, right, because you got a, a big rosette-type succulent and the right. little tiny ones coming off the side. And there's been a lot of breeding work done recently with those, so they're very hardy, and you can grow those anywhere. But a point Deborah was making is the big, huge cactus and succulents mm -hmm. don't grow in really cold climates, so you don't see them. But, you know... Just grow what you can. When, when I was a kid growing up, the neighbors across the street had a huge driveway, three-car driveway. We used to play roller hockey on it. They had on one side a cactus garden, nothing but cacti, succulents. And I remember they had a couple of these big round. They looked like pumpkins. They were round and semi-oblong, and it was a big round cactus with big thorns. You did not want to fall into that. Not golden barrel, right? 
See, at that time, I don't know, I was a kid. I didn't know the difference. It uh-huh. just had big thorns on it, and it was a big round. Closest I can identify with it, it would be like, like a pumpkin, like a round pumpkin, but a big, big green cactus with thorns. Well, Maybe. did you think it was Echinocactus grusonii? That's my, thir- my first thought was that, but then I th- also thought that it might be a, a, a cacti nidolandi, <laughs> which are even more dangerous. <laughs> um, shout out to Jimmy. Jimmy says, Hello, hey. Jimmy. Always good to see that. Hey, guys. And you know what? Deborah Lee still very active on Facebook, and she is uh, really helping our listeners and viewers out with their questions. Um, very, very nice, Deborah. Thank you so much. Patty in San Marcos mentions that it's been three weeks since she's had her air conditioning on. It's been off for the last three weeks, so saving some money. And I've even had to put the heat on a little bit. I really? Just, I just, yeah, a little bit. Get in the shower, get the heat going, get out of the shower, turn it off. We haven't done that, but we two or three times have turned on the fireplace. Well, that's good. You still get some heat from that, right? Yeah, just enough to kind of break the cold. But it, it's but cold. when I got up this morning, it was 41 degrees. What about inside your house? That was inside. Really? <laughs> no, inside was, was cold. It was it was probably like 60, 59, 60 inside. Yeah, and that's cold. Yeah. That is cold. Yeah. So it's getting that to be that time of the year. And, again, those listening to us, various places of the world and the country where it's very cold right now, maybe snowing down in the 20s and 30s, they're, you know, I, they're saying, I wish it was 69 or 55, whatever the case may be. Well, you know, my daughter lives in Idaho, and my son lives in Indianapolis, and both sent pictures today of snowmen that they made. Um, my son in Indianapolis said that uh, yesterday the temperature was 76, and the day before that was 70-something, and today they built a snowman. That's incredible. Uh, hey, by the way, speaking of that, today's my son's birthday, Eric, oh. who used to be our phone screener when he was – I want to say 9, 10, 11 years old. He turns 30 today. Really? <laughs> Eric turns 30. Wow. So happy birthday to you, Eric. I've already sent him his gift. And it's 10 years younger than Tiger. How, bu- how about that, right? <laughs> so happy birthday, Eric. And those of you that have been following our show for, for years that remember Eric, yeah, he's 30. He's also on one of our YouTube videos that we did when we had a, 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 a live remote. Oh, really? Up north huh. was you and me and Sharon. Kevin Boyle was our engineer. Yeah. And, and Kevin Eric, used to do all the remotes. Yeah, yeah. And Eric was, was taking the video. So, yeah, it's been a while. 30 today. And he just bought a farm. Yeah. Yeah, basically. I mean, it's close to a farm, right? It was it's, it's huge. Two, three acres? I, I, from, from the back door to the very end of the fence of the property, walking normal takes two minutes. Wow. That's a long time. Yeah. So they got a lot of plans. It's 120 seconds. Wow, when you put it that way. <laughs> Seems even longer. Okay, so Rick, Rick is, that, oh, John Men- oh, John mentioned in his first book, or oh, mentioned that his first book was, it was on indoor plants. Okay. See, I'm finding the planting mixes for indoor plants is really varied. What do you suggest for an improved mix? You know, just anything that drains well. Uh, soils don't dry out as fast indoors. So it's easy to overwater plants and get the roots to rot. So I find that the potting mixes for outdoors that are, what's the uh, ocean forest we like? Is that, is that a Fox Farm product or is that different? Fox Farm, That is right. Fox Farm, okay. So you can <laughs> use that. Um, I think that might be one of the best. But that type of mix, if you, you could buy any potting soil and you could mix a little bit of perlite or pumice with it to try to improve the drainage mm-hmm. a little. And it'll be okay. I would just stay away from the miracle grow type soils. For me, they're, uh, I tend to overwater anyway. I, I so. call that artificial stimulation. Hmm. <laughs> okay. And, and it does thin out That's the miracle grow fertilizer, right. and they do put the fertilizer in some of the soils. And it does thin out the cell walls of plants. It does. Your plants look good on the surface. But that's like somebody looking really good walking around, but inside their organs are just rotting away. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know what I mean. Let me get a pen so I can take <laughs> some notes. Jot that down verbatim, will you? Oh, Carla said she liked the uh, discussion of uh, that we life were turned. talking about our life. She's, yeah. 
She says plants aren't everything. Yeah. No, I had the dis- discussion so last night with I'm Dana. I'm glad she enjoyed that discussion, but I I might take issue with her s- the second statement she made that plants aren't everything. Well, how about this? I don't know who who. The quote might have been from Vince Lombardi, but I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. Where he said, or somebody of his stature said, "Winning isn't everything; it's the only thing." Ah, I remember that quote. Mm-hmm. But Lenore is agreeing with Carla. We'll have to give that some thought. Hmm. I have a T-shirt that says, uh, <coughs> "What does it say?" It says. A day without plants is like, just kidding, I have no idea. I have no idea, yeah. I think I've seen that as well. Okay, so what we're going to do here is uh, take a break, I think. Just a bit of an early break. We're going to come back. We have one more segment together, John Magnesco, myself, Ryan Main. Still plenty of times, a little back and forth chatter there on the Facebook Live, which we like. It entertains us as well. So if you have any questions, comments, feel free to post them. Anything you want to say before the break? No, Carla said she knew I'd say that. That right. means you listen to the show too often, Carla. And I, Take I, a break once in a while. And I know as far as speaking of breaks. Because they, Garden America isn't everything. It's the only thing. <laughs> Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Okay, we are back. It is our final segment on this uh, Saturday morning, maybe Saturday afternoon, depending upon when you're listening. Uh, Tiger is off with his son's soccer game for the last time this year. It's back with uh, yours truly, Brian Maine, John Bagnasco, right in front of me. And again, looking at um, our Facebook page, Deborah's still involved and going back and forth, answering questions, posting links, so on and so forth. And again, it's been an entire uh, show with Deborah Lee Baldwin here uh, talking to her and, of course, right. uh, afterwards on Facebook. And then Millie had a, I think Millie is in Napomo. Uh, she had a question uh, that she hopes Deborah can answer, but she said that she has uh, spiral aloe that she's had for five years in a pot. Really? Yeah. And it's doing well, well I assume. Well, except the leaf tips all eventually yellow and turn brown. So she wants to know if she, Deborah, might have any tips. And I don't know if Deborah's still there, but if she does, maybe Deborah will answer. But I noticed that uh, unlike other aloes, this one does appreciate some shade. So if you can keep it, if it's in a pot, make sure that it's not in direct sun in the hot summer months. The rest of the year is fine. But in the summer, if you can move it to where it just gets morning sun, that might be best. Sounds like a very challenging plant to grow. Yeah, you know, the first time I saw that was at Antonelli's Begonia Gardens up in the Bay Area. And I walked in and I saw two of those plants and I was like, oh my gosh. That was way before I even knew anything about succulents. Just what is that? Look at that yeah, thing. Yeah, and it it uh, it just captivates you to look at it. It's like, how can this even be real? Right. Yeah. So I bought one back then and killed it. I Deborah said that she stops at killing things three times, and I think I've maybe had ten of those. I don't think that's the right term. Like I killed it. That that would be like a a, a uh, something you set out to do, and it was a deliberate act on your part. I think you just let it expire. Yeah, I. Yeah, it's not killing. It. No, you didn't go out there and pour poison on it or do something to kill it. It it you allowed it to, you allowed it to commit suicide. Well, there you go. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I am tempted to try another one. Well, of course. That, that You know, gardeners are, are like that. Right. We don't want to give up. Except I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until I have an ideal location to put it outdoors. I think uh, I have some new trees that I've planted, but since I planted the trees from seed, 
they're not large enough to grow anything under yet. But when they get a little bit bigger, I might try growing one under. Ta- under Tanya there. says, Antonelli's. My parents used to take us there as a family when I was young. Yeah, that was, um, it was an amazing place. Uh, they were famous for breeding tuberous begonias. They would have those uh, huge begonia. And did you ever visit, uh, when you were young, um, Widener's Begonia Farms? No. In no. Lucadia? No. Uh, that used to, uh, people from all over San Diego would go and dig up their own begonias. They'd plant them in the ground, mm-hmm. and then you'd go there and you'd dig them up. And when I moved here from Michigan, it was uh, the end of June, and we went to Widener's. Uh, My wife and I dug up some begonias, brought them to our house in San Marcos, planted them, and the next day a Santa Ana came through, which I had never heard of. Oh, killed them. Killed every single one. Just burned them to a but, crisp. But, but at that time, you probably didn't associate the Santa Ana winds with killing them, or did you? Oh, yeah, I did. Well, you knew. But I just couldn't believe that there was such a thing. It's like the weather was so nice. I mean, the first night we went to bed, all the windows were open. We woke up. We were freezing in the morning. It's like, how can it get so cold? It was so hot. Get it From Michigan to Southern California. Yeah, it was a learning experience. Yes, yes, Nipomo, right. I'll make sure. Yeah, now see, we've, this is great when, when our Facebook viewers uh, chit-chat back and forth on Facebook. Yeah, the, um, I, that's just one of the things. You know, Deborah was talking about the allopolyphylas the, um, and, and how sensitive they are to who knows what, a lot of different things. So I'm, I'm impressed that Millie kept hers alive for five years. Right. I had one growing in the ground, and in the ground it was doing well until something ended up up covering it up, and it died. And I don't know what happened. Something ended up covering it up. Yeah. What does that mean? You're not not being straightforward with me. (laughs) Something ended up covering it up. There were plants nearby. Okay. And they ended up getting growing out of hand. I didn't trim them back the way I did or should have. And they covered up the plant, and then when I realized, oh, I, my aloe's under there somewhere, it was too late. So it's operator error. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got a couple of minutes left in case you want to uh, post something last minute to us. But again, Deborah Lee, I believe, is still active, and uh, people are going back and forth chit chatting on Facebook Live. Yeah, Carolyn says that she loved uh, Widener's begonias and that uh, Evelyn Widener spoke at their garden club. Oh, how about that? Evelyn was an interesting person. I really liked her. She um, she was an inter- matter of fact, she started, uh, in a way, the whole Proven Winners movement. Really? Right, because she had John Rader uh, worked for her, and they came up with the first Super Tunia at the time and and john ended up going out on his own and starting um euro american Mm -hmm. propagators which uh, eventually went across the country as proven winners with different growers joining in that so yeah that was uh evelyn was a a real pioneer yeah she was well john that is about going to do it uh, for this week's show thank you so much all of you tuned in on the facebook live any last uh Minute words, comments? Yeah, next week, why don't we make Tiger stay the whole show? I think we'll do that. We'll time to the chair if we have to. Right. I uh, I think soccer season's over for him. (laughs) So, again. It's almost Thanksgiving. I know it is. I know it is. A couple of weeks. Thank you so much for tuning in. And, of course, those on BizTalk Radio who uh, listen to these pre-recorded shows, we do appreciate that. Remember to go to our website. At least check in once a day if possible, GardenAmerica.com. Ask Alexa to play our show. She'll do the same thing. And also our YouTube channel, Garden America Radio Show. For the entire crew, myself, Brian Main, John Begnasker, Tiger Palafox, and, of course, all of you who support our show, we love the hearts. We love the love. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Be safe. And we'll do it again next week right here from the iHeart Studios in San Diego, California, Garden America. Take care.